communities push by a workshop. My name is James Chan. Uh, I am the Sustainability Projects Officer here at Kuringai Council. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Dara people who are the traditional custodians of the land of which we present to you from. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. So before I start, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, the panelists for tonight's uh, workshop. Uh, the workshop will be focusing on the West Warunga area and uh, thank you very much everyone for coming along. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jane Scott uh, from Council. Uh, she is the Sustainability Project Leader. Uh, we have Mark Schuster from Council. Say so wait for hello, Mark. Yep. And the Bushfire Technical Officer. We have Sam Tucker from the RFS and uh, Craig Roon also from the far, from the RFS. I believe Craig's a group captain and Sam is a uh, is from the uh, Karingai Bushfire Brigade and you are the Community Engagement Officer, I take it, if I remember correctly, that's right. And, what we, and with us from New South Wales Fire and Rescue, we have Mark McKay. And uh, I think we, we were normally uh, gonna have uh, James Manuel, but he can't make it tonight. Um, Mark, could you tell us uh, what the position is within the uh, fire and rescue? So I'm the duty commander on duty for today for the our Metro East zone, which goes all the way from the harbour all out to the northern beaches and to Barara. So I'm on duty for 24 hours and uh, one of the four platoons that rotate through to give the 24 hour coverage. Great, thank you very much, Mark. So before we uh, start the, the, the main uh, event of the workshop, I'd like to go through some general housekeeping points. Um, so we generally like to keep all the questions through uh, at the end where you have, uh, where you can ask the presenters as any question you like about bushfire. And um, we keep that to the end and uh, there'll be plenty of opportunities to ask questions there. You can ask your questions via the Q and A box that should be on the top of your screen. Uh, or on the bottom. I'm not quite sure exactly what version you have at home. And um, if you have any other issues, any technical issues, or that you want to discuss offline with one of the presenters, please put those issues or those uh, comments into the chat box so we can keep those two things separate. And uh, regarding raising hand function in the workshop, um, uh, please don't use that because uh, we won't be able to respond to you during through the workshop. It's best if you put what it is that you'd like to ask into either the Q&A box or the chat box there. Okay, so I'd like to sort of give you a quick rundown of how the workshop uh, will run and what the purpose and intent of the workshop is. So the Columbia West Community Program was developed in the wake of, of the 2009 Black Saturday fires in Victoria. And it, it incorporates the findings of the Royal Commission that was done in, in, in uh, after that disaster. One of the key findings was that a very few people had bushfire survival plans and those that did, the plans didn't work very well because they didn't take into consideration all the things that could go wrong during a bushfire emergency. So, and the, so uh, the aim of this workshop is to show you the worst case scenario in the Kuringai area so that you can plan for that. This is, this is the situation you can you need to prepare for and if you do that, you can handle anything less than that. And before we get stuck into the actual workshop, I'd like to uh, run a quick poll. It, it's only 10 questions. And if you'd be so kind to answer these questions uh, to the best of your abilities. Now the poll should appear on your screen. Now every question needs to be answered in order for you to, in order for you to submit your, question, your, your answers. Uh, if, an answer, if a question doesn't relate to you or it's not relevant, just tick the, the box or answer that uh, that uh, is closest to your situation. Now, at I think question 10, once you get to it, is about, uh, sorry, no, I think it was question eight. It's about your house. If, if you haven't, if, if the option for a retrofit isn't, isn't listed there that you've done, just put that in the chat. So um, we'll give everyone a couple of minutes to answer these questions and uh, it would be wonderful if you could, uh, answer as much as that as you can. The reason why we ask these questions at the start of the workshop is to get an idea of where you are in terms of your, of your bushfire preparedness so that we can uh, see how much you've progressed later on in the subsequent survey. And if you have any questions or difficulties answering the poll, just pop those into the chat and we'll do our best to answer you. Okay, I can see people are starting to uh, put their answers in. So 
not surprising, most people live in bushfire prone land. Um, and uh, again, not surprisingly, a lot of people haven't actually experienced bushfires before. So hopefully this workshop will, will be very informative and give you the tools to prepare and plan for one should it arrive. Hopefully it doesn't, but it is only a matter of time before a bushfire hits your area. Um, so far it's about 50-50 as to people having bushfire survival plans. That's, that's good to see. Uh, some people do, some people don't. And that's okay if you don't, we're, we're here to help you with that. Okay, so I think um, most people have had a chance to answer the, um, the poll. So I'll give it another 30 seconds or so before we uh, wrap it up and move on with the workshop. Okay, I think uh, most people have answered the poll now. So thank you very much, everyone. I'll close the poll now. So, um, the, how this workshop's going to run? Um, we will run. Th I will run through, or the J Dr. Jane myself and Mark will run through um, the uh, fire that happened in the uh, in, in the town that destroyed the town of Paradise in California back in 2018. After that, we will show you a reconstruction of the Gospers Mountain fire that ran that sort of burnt through the World Heritage Area uh, to the northwest of us. And then following that, we will do a simulated fire in the West Warringah area. And we'll show you, and that's a simulated one where we'll show you fire behavior and how that can um, be changed based on terrain and wind speed and direction and a few other uh, uh, factors. And during that simulation, we'll also show you how you can prepare for fires using the uh, council's website called Climate Wise Communities. So, um, Jenny, I think now's the time to flip over to you and we'll run through the first part of the workshop and that is the campfire that burnt through the uh, town of, Cal uh, of Paradise. Thank you, James. So what we are trying to do by showing you the campfire and the Gosper Mountain fire is just how unpredictable large wildfires can be. Now, this one that happened in the US is uh, probably to date, I think it remains, the single most destructive fire in American history. So to start with, it happened in 2018 in their autumn in November. And it was named after the place of the fire's origin, which was Camp Creek. So it's known as the Camp Fire. And it was just outside the township of Polga, which uh, James will point out, there's a little, a little town up toward the north there. And the township of Polga um, is in Butte County in Northern California. So the timeline, uh, around 6.30 a.m., a power line came down and ignited a fire. Now, the smoke was uh, spotted almost immediately. And the conditions leading up to the ignition of this fire well, firstly, it was a red flag warning day, similar to our catastrophic fire days. There was heavy grass cover from a wet spring that had dried out, unusually dried out through the autumn, decreased humidity to the wind coming off the desert and unusually dry conditions. Hot, gusty winds uh, all contributed to the red flag warning day. So the Fuel loads in and around the township of Polga were high as uh, there was no record of uh, this vegetation part ever having burned to this extent. So on Thursday, the 8th of November, around 6.30, the problem was detected with the power lines around Po Dan. And uh, within a few minutes, calls started to the reporting the fire. Fire tankers were dispatched. Uh, to the fire, but were unable to gain access due to the narrow winding mountain roads that the fire trucks were unable to navigate. Given the wind was gusting over 85 kilometres an hour, it prohibited the water bombing aircraft from flying. 
So it was beyond this acceptable limit of operation. So the aircraft, in fact, weren't able to get up and look, even start looking at this fire until later that afternoon. So the community in Concow, which is a little bit to the south of Polga, um, didn't receive any warnings before the fire hit the town around 7 a.m. So in the space of half an hour, it's already starting to impact um, populated areas. And a caller to seven of the, the, at 7.07 a.m. reported the fire in Concow was ripping due to the high winds. So the fire was traveling very fast. At 7.23 a.m., the township of Polga began its evacuations. And then calls from Concow and Paradise further to the west started to come in over the next hour at the rate of one per minute. They were told there was no danger. The fire was to the north of Concow and Paradise and no evacuations were necessary. And if it became necessary, they would be contacted. Now just remember, America has some of the best technology and equipment available. So it's not like they were unprepared for, for this event. By 8 a.m., the fire had entered the eastern areas of the township of Paradise. Now, the township of Paradise is a little bit further to the west again. You can see the spot fires have started up around Palga and that the fire front itself is rapidly expanding. And very shortly now, you'll see the spot fires start to establish themselves on the eastern side of Paradise. So by the time the eastern areas of the township of Paradise Several minutes went past before the Sheriff's Department issued evacuation orders for the entire town. Um, most of the residents in Concow and many from Paradise were unable to evacuate before the fire arrived. And you can see as this fire, these spot fires that are now very close to Paradise are starting to establish themselves very close to the three exits out of the town one to the north, one to the southwest, and one to the south. And so due to the fires rather, the fire fighters concentrated rather than on fighting the fire, they just turned their attention to saving lives and getting people out of harm's way. The California fire chief on the day said, pretty much the community of paradise is being destroyed. It's that kind of devastation. The wind that was predicted came and it's just wiping us out. So you see how rapidly these spot fires are starting to join together. And now further spot fires have started to the Southwest, effectively blocking off the exit. So there's the exit to the North has been blocked off. The exit to the Southwest is being blocked off. And so everybody's moving onto the road to take them out to the south, which became just this incredible bottleneck. And the traffic wasn't moving because it was way too congested. So the first hours of the fire saw a cascade of failures in the emergency alert system, rooted as it was in a patchwork network with an opt-in nature. So if people didn't opt in, they weren't getting the message and compounded by the loss of 17 cell phone towers. These points of failure in a fast moving fire allowed no room for anyone on the ground. Thousands of 911 calls inundated the two emergency operators on duty. Emergency alerts suffered from human error as city officials have failed to include four at-risk areas in Paradise in their evacuation orders. Technical errors on the day meant the emergency alerts failed to reach 94% of the residents. Now you can see how the fire is just now completely consuming the township of Paradise. In the first four hours of the campfire, it had caused 86 civilian deaths, with a further 12 civilian and five firefighters injured. Some 18,805 structures were destroyed and 62,000 hectares were burnt, 
And that's just in the first four hours of this fire. It, this first four hours produced a total damage bill of $16.5 billion, $4 billion of which was uninsured losses. So the campfire has gone down as the deadliest and most destructive fire in California history. Now, Sam, I don't know, you wanna make any comment at this point? Uh, you're on mute. Sorry. One thing to remember is that whilst this is another country, they have a similar monoculture of vegetation, just like we do. And a lot of these communities are actually built along ridge lines, just like in Karingai. So whilst this may be, you know, across the ocean, it there are a lot of similarities that could actually um, happen in New South Wales and in Karingai, particularly with the failure of um, communications, which is why it's so important to, to stay informed wherever you can. Anybody else want to make a comment? Yeah, I would. Uh, uh, even though Sam says we have a monoculture, it is we do have the most diverse flora in the world. So yeah, if you go up and down gullies, you'll see differences in plant species. And actually with council, we do control burns. And the difficult thing is to account for both asset protection and also the ecological needs of these very diverse plant and animal communities. So it's trying to get what we call the fire regime side right for the animals and plants, and yet also balance asset protection. So a very difficult uh, task. And I'll talk a bit about hazard reduction burns a bit further in. Pretty important stuff. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> now we're going to have a look at the Gosper Mountains fire, which occurred in the 2019-2020 uh, fire season. Uh, now, I think I'm correct in saying this is the single biggest fire in New South Wales, if not Australian history. And uh, it is quite interesting when you watch the fire from the very beginning to the end to see how erratic that fire behaved. It virtually went to sleep at one stage and then the next day it's roaring off again. And then there's spot fires starting left, right and centre. So lots of things that are very hard to predict about where this fire is going to go and when um, happened during this fire. So I'll hand it over to James. Thank you very much, Jenny. So um, as you all know, as Jenny mentioned, it, it was the, the biggest fire uh, in Australian history. And it, uh, it, birthed, it started on, on the 26th of October, 2019 and was only put out by extreme rainfall on around about the 8th of February, 2020. The fire burnt through 512,000 hectares, 90 homes were lost and countless, of anim countless animals and insects were killed. So it's important to talk about the conditions leading up to the fire. It was the hottest and driest year on record. I'm sure you all remember that, uh, the, 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 very, the terrible drought that afflicted all of New South Wales. In three years uh, from January 2017 all the way through to December 2019, areas of New South Wales had had the lowest rainfall on record. All of New South Wales was declared in drought. New South Wales experienced the lowest fuel moisture levels and highest forest fire danger index of all previous fire, pre previous fire seasons. And I do need to point out, and I'm sure Mark will, uh, will emphasize this point, is that it was the low fuel moisture levels which were the key driver of this fire not fuel load. Um, also, there are records being set for the number of days with very high or greater fire danger. And uh, there was no evidence that fire was, that the fire was driven by high fuel loads or, or poor forest management. It was most likely the fact that, average, that there was average fuel loads, but it had record breaking fuel dryness. In fact, um, uh, there was actually uh, uh, some research done into the fires and they found that uh, they had fires burning through areas that had previously, previously had a fire already. Uh, in fact, uh, these, some of these areas had crown fires as well, which that means fires through the canopy of the trees. 
and this was in areas that had already been burnt out. So as mentioned, um, the fire started on the 26th of October, and you can see the, this, the fire start there in the middle of your screen. This fire was started by a lightning strike. It was one of 19,000 lightning, 19, lightning strikes on that day, and a random one happened to uh, pop up to the west of the main cluster, starting this fire here in, in the uh, Wollamine National Park. It started at 10.55, and then two and a half hours after the fire started, it, it burnt through 65 hectares. Also, there were winds of up to 60 to 70 kilometers per hour, which meant helicopters could not fly in and deploy the raft teams that would help put the fire out. The wind also made it a very fast moving fire. So one thing I need to know in the in terms of delivery of this segment, uh, the fire burnt for about uh, for, a few, for, for a few months, and we're going to have to speed through three months worth of fire in, uh, in just a couple of minutes. So I will be speeding up ahead and slowing things down at various points of the workshop. So please bear with me. So it's uh, also what I'd like to point out at the bottom of your screen, there is a timestamp at the bottom of the uh, a timer there. The date is in the American format. So it's the October 27th, 2019. Um, and this will help you keep track of how the fire is progression, progressing. So it's the uh, 27th now, and by this time, 520 hectares were burnt and firefighting resources in the area were already thinly stretched because there were fires all over the region, uh, all over the state and beyond. And as uh, Jenny mentioned uh, previously, the, um, the fire does progress but it, for, at, at a good speed, but towards the 3rd of November, the fire did slow down. It did kind of go to sleep, as some people say. That was due to rain in the area. And in fact, it was close to being put out. So I'll speed things up to that point. And apologies for any background noise. You can hear I have a toddler uh, getting ready for time. So apologies for taking an effort. Um, so uh, the key point to mention is that uh, we're going to go come up to a key uh, sort of um, uh, time point in the timeline of this fire happens around about the 7th of November. So we'll quickly move the fire along to get to that point and then I'll slow it down. Might be worthwhile, James, just mentioning what the different colours indicate. Sure. Um, the colours you can see in front of you and indicate uh, the yellow is the uh, active fire front and then the orange and then dark orange is, is indicating like the burnt out areas. Now, obviously, the thickness of the yellow band doesn't indicate uh, the thickness of the actual of the um, actual fire front. It's just a, it's a general indication. But so the yellow does indicate where the fire front is. It will make more sense, sense once we zoom out as the fire gets larger and larger. So really nothing much is happening apart from the fact that it's a very big fire already, hence having to zoom out already. Um, however, uh, where the fire does calm down, but around about the 7th of, of, of November, there was a change in weather, and that uh, causes the weather the fire to rise up and have a big fire run where it travels 12 kilometers in one day. At this point, there's nothing that could stop the fire. So I'll speed the fire up to that point and uh, you can see that happening. Also, you'll note the fire tends to burn uh, uh, in a southeasterly direction. That's because the, the predominant winds in the air come from the northwest. We're coming, up, we're coming up to the seventh now, and you see a big fire run. There you go. That's that. That's it. There. That's the uh, fire run where things uh, burn very quickly. You know, I think that was twelve kilometers in just one day. So coming up to, as we come up to the 11th, um, now the conditions on this day saw another big fire run to the southwest. The progress of this fire was very fast, and at this point, it's creating its own weather. Um, now, for this fire run, uh, you have 12 kilometers, the fire travels 12 kilometers in about two and a half hours. So that's a much, much faster fire. And um, also bear in mind the fire progresses northwards and southwards at the same time. And by the end of the, 
the day, the fire would have burnt through 56,000 hectares and had a perimeter of 170 kilometers. So keep your eyes peeled for this fire run. It's going to come up uh, very, very, very soon. So I'll speed things up and I'll slow it down again. There you go, it should, should happen round about now. So this is also the day where uh, uh, the conditions that caused this fire run were catastrophic. And this was the same day where we saw the Canoon Road fire in Kuringai. Yeah, you can see that massive fire run there. That's the 12 kilometers in just uh, two and a half hours. So the next uh, uh, point I'd like to, to speed up to is going to be is going to be around about the the um, around about the uh, the thirteenth, which is which is now. And I think the uh, next thing we'll have to talk about is going to be the Ember attack. So I'll zoom out again so you can have a better view. Um, now the now at this point Embers will start. You'll see Embers travel ahead of the main fire front, starting fires outside the main body of the fire, that, that has the effect of speeding the fire up and expanding it a lot, a lot quicker. And uh, uh, if anyone would like to talk about Ember attack uh, during, this, uh, during this fire, please uh, speak up. I think a, yeah, I'll, I'll talk, James. Yeah, yeah. Uh, many people don't realise that 86% of all Australian house loss in our European history has been due to Ember attack, not due to what they call radiant heat where heat from the fire front hits the side of a house. It's due to embers, which can travel up to 20 kilometres. I've, I've known them go nearly 30 across from, uh, from Brisbane across the Stradbroke and Bribey Islands. So yeah, they do travel with the wind very well. And if you've got leaves in the gutter or mulch at the base of your house, uh, embers can easily catch and set, set a house alight. So just to let you know that most Australian houses are lost due to embers and embers do travel so far and so quickly. And our stringy, stringy barks around Sydney are particularly good at uh, putting embers up in the air. Thanks, James. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, there's some very good points. And yes, uh, the type of tree that we have around Kuringai can play a very big role on the embers that can land in, in and around your house. So I'll quickly speed the progression up to the 25th of um, November. Now, around about this time, is, uh, there was a lot of storms in the area. That led to lightning strikes, which, as you know, uh, started this fire. It also starts a few other fires to the northwest and to the north. And just also keep an eye on the embers that keep up, these spot fires that start up around the southwest as well. Yeah, so and these spot fires join with the main, main body of the fire front, making, making it much, much bigger. So right about the 27th, you get these lightning strikes. And you see them, they, they started and they've started, they've, they've caused those uh, fires to the northwest, northeast. Uh, these fires uh, were named the Little Elk Complex, the Thompson's Creek and Three Mile Fire. And uh, later on, you'll see this S fire join the main body of the fire fire. And that's where, that's, at that point, the fire, the Gospels Manor fire becomes known as the mega fire. I think, Sam, you were involved in that fire fight, weren't you? Yes, and Craig and Ian, where um, my, I actually have a property that I had to keep reducing the fires near me um, watch zone because I was getting alerts every five minutes. Um, so it, it was a very long and extended um, session of firefighting. Craig, do you have anything to add? Uh, just reinforced, yeah, it was a long time. Uh, a lot of us started up by the border in Queensland, um, ended up down by the Victorian border. And yeah, we all sort of came back to work on the Gospers fire. So, mm, so stretch pretty thin. Yeah. I think also now might, might, might be a good point to talk about the, um, the efforts that were put in to put in fire breaks or, uh, or, or backburns around about the Hawkesbury River or Wiseman's Ferry area. Does anyone, would anyone like to talk about that? Because I think that was crucial to uh, stopping the fire reaching the northwest of, of, of Sydney. 
Did, did anyone have experience with that? Yeah, I can talk to that. So with the Hawkesbury RFS, National Parks, um, Fire Rescue, they came up with a plan to try reduce the fuel load in front of the main fire front. Uh, so for a couple of weeks, we did several shifts a day. So a day shift, swing shift, and then a night shift. And basically started Wiseman's Ferry, went north up through McDonald and all those areas. And then the sort of the south west through to Colo Heights and so forth. And yeah, capture that fire before it actually came through and hit the Hornsby Karingai area. Thankfully. <laughs> That's great. Um, also, now's a good point to mention the, uh, the, the, the fires to the northeast have now started to join the main uh, Gosford Mount fire. Now, this is the point where the fire is the biggest fire in Australian history and is now known the, as, the, um, as the mega fire. In fact, uh, at this point, the fire was uh, about five times the size of Singapore. And so five times, yeah, five times bigger than Singapore itself. So that's quite a big area. So as we creep, as we uh, creep up to the, um, the, uh, the, the next key point in the, in, in the fire's history, uh, that happens around about the, um, the 13th of December. So we'll speed things up just so that we're not here all night. I know it's moving unrealistically fast, as if it isn't already. Um, so the key, what happens on the uh, 13th, 14th is the, actually it happened on the 14th of December, actually. It was the um, Mount Wilson backburn. So, you know, the other uh, RFS were, had planned this, this backburn to help contain the fire so that it do, does, that doesn't impact properties. And the weather conditions on the day were fairly, were, were fairly mild with little or, or no wind. However, by 2 p.m., the wind picked up from the southwesterly direction, and then uh, within by 2:54, the, the first spotovers were uh, started happening, and then 30 minutes after that, the crews were doing property protection. So, uh, so an unexpected wind change uh, made the the, the backbone uh, sort of burn out of control, and and that's. Uh, you know, let, let's to 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 let some losses. So I'll press play now, and you can see how, how quickly that happened. And if anyone has an experience or a knowledge about this backbone, and will definitely feel feel free to um to to to, to, to comment on this. And uh, it does happen pretty quickly, so keep an eye out on the uh, on the bottom of your screen there. There you go. That's the backbone now, and you can see how quickly it it, it progresses. So yeah, that was a very fast uh, sort of fire there. This fire then joins the main, main body of the fire. So the next, uh, so we'll speed things up again. And the next point I'd like to draw your attention to is the 21st of December. This is when the catastrophic fire conditions were, were, were declared yet again from, from New South Wales. And uh, again, as mentioned, ran about the Hawkesbury re region. Um, the fire crews were very were working very hard to stop the fire jump the Hawkesbury River. Uh, we had strike teams from interstate and overseas had joined the battle, and then uh, and then plans were made to evacuate the Hornsby area and uh, Hills district. Experts uh, who, are, who who are researching fire said that um, the fire could have covered the distance from Wisens Ferry to, to the urban fringe of Hornsby within just one day. And this is highly possible based on the speed of early fire runs you saw. Luckily, a, a southerly wind blew the flames back and the fire crews, that helped the fire crews to contain the fire. So this highlights the fact that fire can move very quickly and can potentially lead to mass evacuations in the North Shore. And these mass evacuations are unlikely to go smoothly. As Mark mentioned, embers can travel between 20 to 30 kilometers ahead of the main fire front, starting new fires, and further, that are likely to further complicate matters. So luckily, the fire was contained uh, at the Hawkesbury River, and, uh, and that was very fortunate for, for us. Um, however, it's, uh, it, it's important to bear in mind Lithgow down here to the southeast or southwest of the, of the fire here is scientifically impacted. And um, 
you know, overall we're fairly, fairly lucky, but it could have been much different, very different had the working conditions not been as favorable. So I'll stop the, the simulation now, because the fire does go on for a good long while, but nothing else happens. So I think uh, now we'll move on to the next part of the workshop, Jenny, unless there's someone else, someone, unless there's something someone someone would like to say about uh, the fire and their experience of it. Yeah, I just think it's worth noting the three mile fire that went up the central coast. Mm -hmm. um, that did jump the Hawkesbury up there and that went very close to their urban interface. But it's just to show how quickly it actually moved through that area. Um, if it had got across at Wiseman's, yeah, it could be a totally different story. Mm. And um, to uh, just give everyone a bit of context, uh, that's how big the fire was. And you can see it in relation to Sydney itself. It's actually larger than Sydney. And that was just one fire. There was also a fire in in the other part of the Blue Mountain to the south of the Great Western Highway. And there were fires up and down the east coast of New South Wales, stretching in, into Victoria and Queensland. So that was one hell of a fire season. It was quite something. And hopefully we'll never have that again. People have to remember too that fires are just a natural part of Australia's uh, sort of biota, I suppose, and they have driven the evolution of most plants and animals. For instance, out in the Great Western Desert on the Northern Territory, uh, Western Australian border, there's fires there that go through the Spinifex country, probably almost unnoticed, and they, they can have a fire front of 100 to 150 kilometres. So they're pretty big fires too, but because they're out of the way, they don't gain too much sort of uh, media coverage. <laughs> Oh, yeah. and one thing I forgot to mention, uh, oh, thanks Mark for that, but uh, uh, the one thing I forgot to mention was that the fire was eventually put out by extreme rainfall. So we went from extreme drought to extreme fire to extreme rainfall, and uh, that that rain event caused wide-scale power outages in, in the Kuringa area. Some areas had, uh, had, had power outages for about two weeks. And Warragamba Dam went from 40% capacity to 90% capacity. And I don't think it's dropped below 90% since then as well. And we've just had rain upon rain upon rain and tragic flooding. Okay, so I think that's us for the Gospel of Mountain Fire. We'll move on to the next portion of the workshop. Over okay. to you, Dr. Jenny. Scott. Thanks, James. So the next one is that now that you know how erratically these, these fires can uh, behave and the limitations of any fuel reduction in terms of um, slowing those fires down. We've seen that um, it is very difficult to take out fuel when you've got a fire that burns through an area and then several weeks later comes back and burns through the area again. You can see that um, uh, hazard reduction burns have their limitations. They're very useful in lower intensity fires, um, but when you get to this scale of fire, this kind of weather, weather conditions, that's when um, uh, you, you don't want to be depending on the fact that there was a hazard reduction near your place not so long ago, because it, it in all likelihood might reduce some of the embers, but it doesn't mean you're going to be safe. So what we're going to do now, <laughs> we're going to look at a fire and it's a simulation. So this fire hasn't happened and it's one of many thousands of ways a fire could happen in this particular location. We've just picked one randomly and we're going to look at uh, how the weather affects this fire behaviour. Now, if you look up uh, to the left, you'll see there's a blue circle with like a little arm in it that James is whizzing around. And that allows us to control the wind speed and direction. The temperature is already set at 35 degrees with low humidity. So we're trying to simulate here a red flag or a catastrophic, I better not use the American term, fire danger rating. And, um, and actually, Sam, I might get you to come in on that point and just explain the new fire danger ratings. So the New South Wales RFS have um, 
developed a new fire danger rating system that now uh, draws us in line with the rest of Australia so there's more consistency. Um, previously, there were several options and there weren't clear actions related to that and it was quite dated. So now we have a fire danger rating system which relates to the potential risk due to weather and fire activity for a particular day in a particular location. Um, you may have seen the new fire danger rating signs, which, which are a half pie, say, that's divided into four with a white line that indicates that there is no imminent risk of fire, but it doesn't mean that it's out of the question. And then um, that progresses. Should I bring up the new fire danger ratings on, on the new tab to show everyone? If you, that would be awesome. Um, it moves from little risk to a moderate risk where we suggest that you plan and prepare um, and stay up to date with information that's available about um, any fire activity in your area. Uh, it then moves to high, which is a yellow uh, color and that indicates the action of being ready to act. So there's a heightened risk of the potential for fire in your area and you need to have a fire plan and know what to do and decide how to act when if a fire were to start during that high period. We then move to both extreme and catastrophic and and I think um, Jenny has mentioned the red flag or catastrophic uh, during catastrophic fire conditions and in the event that a fire does actually start, uh, your best bet is to actually leave the bushfire risk area. And, and to be able to do that in good conscience, having a great fire plan, being resilient, preparing yourself, your family, your community and your property allows you to leave early. And um, I just can't reiterate uh, that there's, there's a chance that there will not be a fire truck for every property, for every street or every location. So being able to leave early is really important. Um, you can get all that information on the New South Wales RFS site. And um, I really do encourage everyone to have fires near me on their uh, phone and set up a watch zone so that you can be informed when there could be an issue in your area. Do, Craig or Ian, do you have anything to add to that? I just reiterate the fires near me app is fantastic. You can set up your watch zones and you can keep up to date what's actually going on. Okay, thanks for that. Good to clarify that. Um, and I think it also raises an important point. There are lots of locations in Karingai with run, one road in and one road out. And uh, if you live in a location like that, you definitely don't want to be caught there in a fire. So the whole objective of using the sim table and climate-wise communities is to get the first message across, which is leave early. And on a catastrophic fire day, just leave. Whether or not a fire has ignited, just leave. And go and stay out for the day. And then if it's all well, go back in the evening. But you've got to plan for these sudden eventualities to occur. And getting your property ready, as Sam said, so that it's got half a chance of surviving the fire without you being there is also very important. So James, shall we move to Climate Wise Communities just to have a quick intro to that? Sure, Jenny, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll share that screen. One second, here we go. Okay, so this is a website called Climate Wise Communities that council runs. And it was developed as James said earlier, out of the research done in 2009 as to why was it that so few people who were impacted by those fires 
had bushfire survival plans? And of those that did have bushfire survival plans, why did so many of them fail? And the fundamental answer to that they found was because the fire happened in a way they didn't think it would. They had this idea that the fire would occur, that they'd get so much warning that there'd be, you know, a fire truck nearby, that um, they wouldn't be caught without any water, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, all these variables do occur and make a massive difference to your capacity a, to leave, and B, to fight the fire if you leave too late. So this working your way through this tool will give you lots of reasons to consider your personal circumstances and how you might deal with some of the vulnerabilities to bushfire that you have and how to strengthen your resilience um, to those catastrophic events. I have to apologize at this point, my internet's a bit slow and the website's uh, struggling to load. So that's the reason why you haven't been able to see anything new on the screen. Okay. So what you'll see when James's computer finally gets stacked together is you will see five steps involved in this process. With the first step being understanding the risk of your location. The second step about your personal situation and how that might affect your bushfire plan. And then looking at your property to see how resilient it is or how vulnerable and what you might be able to do to reduce that vulnerability. And then the fourth step is looking at how well you communicate um, with your neighbourhood and whether you can discuss with your neighbours um, having a neighbourhood plan to help make sure that people who need help get help and that um, everybody's on the same page about evacuating. And if you're going to stay and defend, we know who's going to stay and defend and um, whether or not that's a, a reasonable objective or, you know, almost total suicide. So and the fifth step is just giving you some templates for some of the plans with RFS and SES. Uh, that you can fill in afterwards. So this is helping you develop all the information and then you fill out your plan. So if we can go to the first step, Jane. Yeah, it's really struggling. I'm, I do apologize. Uh, I think it's this time of the evening, everyone's jumping online in Barara. They are just uh, streaming Netflix or something, I don't know, but the bandwidth here gets choked up pretty quickly this time of the evening, so apologies for that. The frogs must be affecting it. Yes, I can hear the frogs have jumped into Netflix. <laughs> it is quite busy around here. I hope the frogs eat my slugs. Um, anyway, back to the workshop. <laughs> so, um, Jenny, we can go back to the sim table and start the uh, start the simulation simulated fire if you like. Uh -huh. Okay. So, as as uh, we mentioned before, this isn't a real fire. This is one that could happen. And, um, and we're going to show you how a fire under catastrophic conditions might behave. So James is going to ignite a fire, a little fire bug that he is. And he's gonna slow it down a bit. <laughs> and there's the ignition point over near Pennant Hills Park. And I do believe that has happened before, that a fire, I think it was 94 or possibly 2003, uh, a fire did ignite there and run down the Lane Cove Valley. Um, so there you can see the fire is quite quickly establishing itself. So at this point in time, Sam, what would RFS be doing? So as you've mentioned, um, if, if it is actually catastrophic fire conditions and the fire danger rating for that day is catastrophic, we would have strike teams um, of members, volunteer members at probably every station in Hornsby and Karingai on standby, if not on standby at the station 20 minutes away. The closest uh, RFS crew would be sent to investigate this fire and to confirm um, the activity that that is actually in place, that would then be referred back to uh, fire control uh, centre and 
an alert level would be put up on fires near me to indicate action. Uh, depending on risk to property, there may be alerts sent to individuals um, within that area. But for instance, like in South Taramara, the fire that started there during the black summer fire season, emergency warnings to shelter in place were set, sent out to residents probably within 10 minutes of the fire state starting because of the catastrophic fire conditions on that day and the risk risk to life and property. Did uh, Craig or Ian or our fire and rescue um, member like to add anything to that? The fire rescue has a protocol on, on those kind of catastrophic days where we would move up appliances from across the GSA to those stations or to the uh, bush urban interface. So that the idea being that we get a much uh, greater response to, to fires that break out. So we move up uh, stations out of the GSA and we might also form up a strike team, which might be a number of appliances and a strike team leader who might stand by somewhere convenient so that they can respond directly to that fire as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, additionally, you'd have national parks on standby. Um, they have good knowledge of the, the parks and so forth. You'd also have the incident management team standing up, um, which has an incident controller, logistics, planning and so forth. There's a number of different roles there that has representatives for fire rescue, RFS, parks, council, and so forth. So informed decisions can be made. Right. Okay. So what um, you can see in that blue circle up there to the left, is that the wind speed is, uh, is not very strong at this point in time. And so we're going to make it that during the day, the wind speed picks up a little bit. And one of the features you'll see from the bushfire program that sits behind this in the software is that when the fires get to the top of ridges, that's when they tend to put off their, their embers. And the embers get caught in the wind and they travel further ahead of the fire front. So this is what makes the fires all of a sudden going from uh, looking like they're traveling fairly slow to, oh, well, in fact, they're traveling really fast. And there's a whole bunch of new fires just established. In the Gosper Mountain fire, it was lightning strikes as well, which you know can certainly happen when these fires get bigger. So, in this situation, you need to think about what you'd be doing at this point in time. Now, by now, if you've got a good plan, you'll know if you're going to stay and defend or leave early. And for a few people in that area, leave early would already be too late. So when we say leave early, we mean leave very, very early. Don't hang around, particularly if it's one road in and out. So you can see the fires picking up now a little bit in speed and shifting slightly in direction. The fire's starting to burn in a range of areas. And um, at this point in time, um, there's going to be a number of areas down that uh, uh, location that are under threat um, because as we pick the wind up even further, and in fact, when the wind changes direction, you'll see that the story changes along with that. So at this point in time, you would have looked at step one of climate wise communities, and you would have been able to bring up an outline of your property in the council's mapping system. And it'll be colored with different colors. And what the different colors indicate are whether you are at risk of um, radiant heat, whether you're at risk of ember attack, whether you're at risk from storms, uh, whether you're at risk from um, extreme heat, et cetera. Now, in tonight's presentation, we're just looking at um, <clears throat> bushfire, but in many cases, something that you do to reduce bushfire risk will also give you benefits for other disaster types like extreme heat days. So if you were, for example, to put bushfire rated shutters on your windows, they also help keep the heat out. 
So it's worth considering um, the benefits, the multiple benefits of some of these strategies you can use to reduce your, uh, your house's vulnerability to bushfire. So you're thinking, okay, well, I've either got out of there long before and we're just hoping our house is still there when we go home. Or you're thinking, well, um, I've left it too late to leave. So now I need to look at my stay and defend plan. So if you've decided to stay and defend, you've got to think about a whole lot of variables that can happen that might mean you actually can't actively defend your house and you are just sitting inside waiting for the fire to pass. So Sam, if somebody is caught inside and just waiting for the fire to pass, what's the best advice we can give them? I think one of the most important things is um, to ensure that you have been keeping up to date with the activity of the fire and that if you're aware that the fire front is approaching your property that, and you've been told to shelter in place through an emergency warning, that you find a room on the opposite side of the fire front within your property with the capacity to both see outside and exit in more than one way. So uh, say a, a a toilet room is not necessarily your best bet as you, whilst you can see outside, you can only exit into the house and probably not through the small toilet window. And the, the reason for being able to see outside is that the moment that you know the fire front has passed, you're actually able to get outside and deal with any um, spot fires that may be on your property because very often um, the integrity of say your roof line and the structure of your building has probably been impacted by the intensity of the fire and there could be fire within the cavity of your roof and could cause greater risk to you. Um, anyone else have anything to add to that? Okay. Well, that's, um, that's good advice. And certainly uh, um, there have been instances where people have sheltered inside their homes uh, only for the roof to cave in and block their exit out because the roof had caught fire and they didn't know. So that's so important to have an exit straight to the outside um, on the far side of the fire. So choose your room to shelter in wisely. Hey Jenny, I should be able to uh, show everyone the um, the Climbhouse Community's webpage now. Okay. Go to that. I'm sharing it via a different account. I signed in from a different account, so. So this is the landing page, and there are the five steps that we spoke about. We'll just quickly have a look at the first and second step. So the ready check tool is what it's called. And um, it goes through, I think you have to sign up. Oh, I must have done that. Okay, so we just scroll down and you put your address in to this um, search engine and it will then find your property and show you an outline of it. Now this is just a random property that James has selected. And you can see these people have um, flood issues. They also have bushfire issues, ember attack issues as well. But they don't have only one road in and out. So they have two possible exits. So if we scroll down, you'll see there's a summary there in the bottom of the page telling you what risks you need to plan for. Now, this is a multi-hazard. So uh, certainly if you, as I said, consider the benefits of whatever you do for bushfire to those other hazards, you're only all the better off. But certainly this place is um, both radiant heat and ember attack. The only thing they don't have is exit issues. Now you can save that to a PDF and that means council doesn't want to be responsible for your data, particularly the next lot of data and um, only you have it. 
But if you go out without saving it to a PDF, then it's lost. So make sure you do take that step. And then if we go to step two, which is your personal situation, it's a lots of things about your personal situation that need to be considered when you're doing your bushfire plan. And so if you live with other people or you have um, young children or you have people with a disability or you're responsible for elderly people, then there are a whole range of ways to factor that into your bushfire plan. Also, if you have a, a medical condition and you need to be able to um, take your medical equipment with you or your medicines, you need to have that pre-organised and pre-prepared so when you have to go, you can go quickly. Remembering this is why we want you to go early so that you're not in a rush and, and leave things behind um, because of the rush. You get out in uh, well in advance when you can stay calm and relaxed and remember everything. So will it scroll down, James? It will. I don't know if you can make the screen any bigger. It's very small. So it's just asking you a series of tick the box questions. Do you live alone or with others? Um, the people in your household, whether they're children, elderly, special needs. Are you a carer? And every time you tick on a box, it will come up with a suggestion about why you need to consider certain aspects of this into your bushfire plan. Just as I've spoken about just a moment ago, um, there are certain aspects that do change and more consideration needs to be given for um, personal situations of different people. The other thing that uh, often comes up is around pets in households. So there's many a story told about people um, going back for pets when they, in the rush, have not taken them or in the panic to get them out, the dog or the cat or whatever has run off and they can't find them. And people then tend not to leave until they do find their beloved pet, which can put them all in great danger. So having the dog already tied up or the cat already in a carry cage, you know, to go out for the day is a, a wise precaution and not leaving that till the last moment. Whether or not you've got your own transport or you're going to be dependent on someone else, and is that person you're dependent on going to be available when you need them? And if they're not, what's your plan B? Who else could you get who might be able to fill in that role if your uh, first choice isn't available? English proficiency of that and your neighbours needs to be considered so that you do get the right messaging and understand the messaging that uh, is being put out. Home ownership, because it's a lot easier for people who own their own homes to um, improve the resilience of their homes and not have to negotiate with a landlord. And then there's phone connection and communication, so vital as we've already spoken about. So if the mobile phone um, goes down, and uh, you only have landline, if the power goes down, you don't have landline. So it is very feasible you could be left with no telephone communication at all, in which case we go over to listening with the app, or if you can't get a signal, you're not going to get the app. So you're listening to your ABC on the radio. You've got a battery radio is best, so that you can keep up to date with the um, uh, fire warnings that have been put over that medium. So the ABC Sydney 702 is the local emergency broadcaster, and that's the next best way to keep up to date. Jenny, so we also recommend, sorry, we also recommend that you program the 702 ABC into your car radio as well, because in the event that you have no power, no internet, and no phone line, you can actually whip out to your car, turn it on and um, ensure that you are kept informed. 
Good. And of course, that's the worst case scenario, but planning for that only way is up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we strongly encourage you to plan for the worst case scenario, because as Sam said, if it isn't the worst case scenario, then you're sweet. But if you don't plan for it and it is, then you've got problems. Okay, let's go back and have a look at our fire, see what it's up to. Poor James, he's having to swap between websites. Okay, now you can see this fire has really got going now and is starting to impact multiple areas. Sam, at this point, what's happening in RFS? We would be on heightened awareness. There would be multiple strike teams um, placed around the, the area. There would probably be already um, strike teams from out of area placed and we would be working very closely with uh, fire and rescue police and other agencies to basically protect life and property. Looking from this, and I'm looking on my phone screen, unfortunately, but there would have already been a variety of emergency warnings sent out to probably the Warunga, South Taramara, West Pimble, North Epping and a variety of other areas, particularly as um, this may start to impact uh, residents that may be at risk, such as uh, schools and, and hospitals and that sort of thing. And being aware that most fires often ramp up in the afternoon when there is more traffic on the road and um, visibility would be completely um, reduced. Yeah, fire and rescue. So by this stage, we would be in what we call property protection mode. So, you know, bearing in mind, we don't have four wheel drive tankers that can go off the road by and large. So we'd be in the streets anticipating where the fire is going to pop up out of a gully or burn up a slope. But I think um, Sam said this before, there, there are not enough fire trucks for one to be parked outside every house to save your house. And we, we might turn up and do what we call structural triage where we look at the construction of a house, you know, what sort of vegetation there is, what access there is, uh, what kind of water supply there is. So we, we might decide that we, we just cannot, you know, attempt to save one particular house. There might be a couple that we can save. So there, there will not be enough fire trucks to go around. Water supplies often get compromised when you have lots of fire trucks in every second street drawing water uh, and attacking the fire or defending the houses. So, you know, ideally you don't rely on a fire truck turning up to save you. And, the uh, you know sheltering in place is only kind of a valid response if you haven't left before. It's not necessarily ideal to think that you can just stay in the house and you'll be fine. Yeah, and um, I think that's a really important thing to plan for. Uh, in America, they've got a, a slogan that says "It's all you for seventy-two," meaning don't depend on help coming within 72 hours in major events. So you plan for the first 72 hours and um, you'll be fine. Well, fine. I say that in inverted commas, but you've got your best chance. So in Australia, we would hopefully get help to you sooner than that. But certainly I know some of the big cyclones up north it has been a week or so before they've seen anybody come in to help. So you can see the fire is progressing. And um, in a little while, we're going to change the direction of the fire. But before we do, we'll just quickly have a look at the property uh, section of Climate Wise Communities, because communities, this is an important one. Knowing about your house and how resilient it is, and what you could do to improve that resilience, particularly if you're not going to be there. Uh, well, even if you are there, you want it to be as resilient as possible because you're going to depend on it for shelter. What we do get people to do is first off, is uh, draw a little mud map of their property where the vegetation is. If you have a swimming pool, make sure you put an SWS sticker out the front near your letterbox. And that says that there's a static water supply available 
for the firefighters to use. So as uh, was just mentioned about um, being water, water being available, uh, if it is, they're more likely to try and defend your house. So you do that little map and it gives you a feeling for what are the strengths and weaknesses of your place. And then if we scroll down, you'll see you can look at four disaster types. Tonight, we're just going to look at bushfire. And it has a legend here. So if, if the description of the, for example, the first thing is the roof. If the description fits best to your roof is red, it means it's a serious weakness. If it's green, it means it's much more resilient. So you need to think about the kind of roof that you have. And if you've got an aged brick and tile with loose mortar where the tiles tend to lift a little bit in the wind, um, they're great entry points for embers to get in. So the embers will just get sucked straight into your roof cavity. So if you've got a metal roof that's finished off properly to a high bowel rating level, say flame zone, then it's going to be much more difficult for the embers to gain entry to that roof space. We look at roof sprinklers, not that they're a panacea, but they do help. <clears throat> roof lights, roof ventilators and vent pipes need to be uh, meshed up so that the embers can't get in there. And eaves and fascias need to be in good condition, not flaky old paint or dried out timber. And that gives you uh, a better chance of um, preventing the embers from entering through those gaps. The gutters and downpipes, of course, need to be kept clear for the fire. And uh, in some cases, people fill their uh, gutters with water and by blocking um, the downpipe with, uh, I think it's a tennis ball is what they'd use. But there's also a valve you can put in to keep the water trapped in your gutters so that um, even if you need to get a few embers blow in, um, they'll be damp and get put out. We look at the walls. And again, we go through various aspects of the walls. I think, yes. So, and what um, type of material the wall is, what condition it is in. Uh, windows and window frames, whether you've got um, uh, heat toughened glass or double glazing on the side that faces the bushland gives you much more resilience to, uh, to radiant heat. And then looking at the, the external doors, and the condition and the type of timber that they are, uh, and also the door surrounds. And the around the windows, uh, the window frames, if they're timber and they're a light pine of some sort, which can easily catch a light. And um, so that gives you some ideas about how vulnerable your window areas are. And remember, often you don't have to change the glass all around the house, but that side of the house where the radiant heat is likely to be an issue. We look at garage doors because they often are weak points. And also the subfloor space, people who store things under their floors and uh, it dries out and it pre creates perfect fuel for embers to ignite. So you've got to think of uh, what type of flooring you have and whether you store things under there. Uh, verandas and veranda deckings, a lot of the new timbers um, that they're producing now are uh, timber, they're fire resistant. Um, most of the older ones are not, but if you've got concrete, of course, then uh, you're sweet. And then we look at the outdoor areas. So, if there are any vertical bar barriers to shield the building. So that might be um, a, a bit of a hill. It might be the landscaping is, and I'll get Mark to talk about this in a second, but set out in clusters uh, so that the fire doesn't travel up to the house. And then the water supply, 
whether you've got a pool, whether you've got a firefighting tank and a firefighting pump to go with it, all the better. And certainly if you're thinking of staying and defending and you don't have a water supply, then you're probably not in a position to defend at all. Um, fences and gates can be points of ignition as well as gas bottles, both the gas bottles for the house and for the barbecue and um, locating them to areas where the, the actual valve is turned away from the house. So if they heat up and the gas vents when it goes under pressure from the heat, the flame will shoot away from the house, won't set your house on fire. So the house age and the standard, and Mark's going to talk about that in a moment. Doormats are one where fires often, uh, embers catch doormats a lot. So if you've got those uh, nice dry, um, uh, rough coir formats, uh, doormats, you can find that the embers can set them alight, then set the door alight, which then sets the internal part of the house a lot. Um, pets and enclosures, we've already spoken about if your plan is to leave your pet there, how can you put it in its best possible place for it to survive? Of course, just like you, best thing is for it not to be there. Okay, Mark, um, a little bit about landscaping and uh, house design and the bowel levels. Yeah, I'll talk, thanks Jenny. I'll talk about bowel or bushfire attack level first. And it's really measured in what they call fire line intensity, a bit scientific, but don't worry. It's kilowatts per thousand kilowatts per square meter. Now for a human body to withstand a fire, it would only take about two to three, which is in bowel low, two to 3000 kilowatts a square meter for about 20 seconds. If you had PPE on, all the fire suit and everything, a little longer, but not much longer. You, Bell 19, that's 19,000 kilowatts per square metre. That's getting pretty high. Most houses in Karingai are built to either Bell Low or Bell 19 standard because they were built before the prescriptions or the Australian standard for building in bushfire, AS3959, came in. And if you want a house to even attempt to withstand a bushfire, it has to be bell 40 to flame zone, what they call flame zone. But even then, there's no guarantee the house will withstand it. So when you get a development assessment done, if you're in a bushfire prone area, which is most of Karingai, uh, you'll need to get a consultant to do a bell report. How, with, how sustainable is your house or the extension being done on your house? Now, uh, methods of mitigation can include uh, hazard reduction burns, which we've mentioned, but also asset protection zones, which either Council or New South Wales National Park provides between your yard and the hazard, which is the vegetation. Now, another way is you can have your own internal APZ in your yard, which is great, because all you have to do is try and separate both horizontally and vertically any fire runs. So to do that, you wouldn't have a wall of vegetation leading straight up to your house. You try and separate the plants both horizontally, might be uh, 20 to 30% of plants and the rest is open. And also uh, vertically, you wouldn't have a wall of either shrubs or a wall of trees. Try and vary the spatial arrangement vertically of your plants and trees. Now, New South Wales RFS has some wonderful guidelines, but I must admit the best in Australia are on the web, they're produced by CFA, Country Fire Authority in Victoria, a landscaping guide. It's about 100 pages, very comprehensive and very, very good. So if anyone emails me at any stage, I can give them the reference, but it's on the web. Really, it's I can't overemphasise how important landscaping is, particularly in our green shire, Karingai, where we all love our trees, but landscaping will make your own APZ within your own yard even, so it's so important. But uh, yeah, there's lots to learn and lots to know every day. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to add anything at this point? Can I just add that um, that external maintenance and management of your home is something that even renters can achieve and be involved with and um, it gives them some more control over their fire protection. And I'd like to just also uh, add to what uh, 
uh, Sam and Mark said, I was at a conference recently and uh, <clears throat> the a CSIRO bushfire research had made a very interesting comment that um, houses that's uh, during the Black Summer fires, houses that had a for sale sign in front survived the fires during the Black Summer a lot better than houses that did not have a for sale sign. So th that just goes to show that um, well-maintained landscaping or around the house is a, um, a very good passive defense strategy for your home. And passive defense means that you don't need to be there to defend the house. It will the house will defend itself because you have maintained a uh, nice landscaping around your house, no mulch, um, replace wood mulch with pebble or gravel mulch around the house. And, uh, and just to clarify a point that Mark made, in terms of a vertical sort of um, connection with bushland, I think, uh, well, is it um, the ladder effect you're referring to, Mark, about just creating a, a, yeah, a disconnect it's called the fuel laddering. ground uh, it's called fuel laddering, where fuel will travel. Well, I mean, the fire front will travel along what they call a fuel ladder. It just promotes the fire. So if you can break up or fragment the fuel ladder, that's the way to do it. It does really help with smaller fires, that's for sure. So, so in practice, that would mean low shrubs uh, that do not reach up into the lower branches of a canopy or a tree. Is that yeah, that's right. Breaking that continuity. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And there's even lists of species for each area, suitable garden plants. Some are exotic, some aren't. Uh, the lily pill is pretty good, for instance, as a not a fire retardant, but it's less flammable. So there's wonderful lists for that that you can easily uh, get to on the web. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. So we're going to go back to the fire now. And we're going to change the wind direction. So we're still blowing from the northwest. A southerly buster is coming in and is going to affect the fire quite considerably. So we look at the areas that are being impacted to the south of the fire, but now to the north of the fire, it's all of a sudden what was the side, the fire flank, is now becoming the fire front. So there's a whole bunch of houses in the way. And so Sam, what happens now? I might actually refer this up the line to Craig, I think, because this is well above my pay grade at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we would know when the southerly was due, um, in approximate time. Um, between fire rescue, us, we'd be looking at pre-deploying units, uh, strike teams staging up, uh, doing triage of the area, knowing what's actually happening. Um, and uh, knowing that this is going to happen because we have seen it happen and at the same time looking after any of the places that have been impacted earlier in the day as well. I don't know, Mark, you got anything extra? Yeah, I'd like to add actually because I could see it heading up towards Browns Road East where, which is a pretty vulnerable area. We just had a hazard reduction burn there, but I've been monitoring that and the growth is getting, even after a year and a half now, the growth is getting so rapid after all the wet weather we've had that it would carry a fire again. Uh, one good thing, uh, the police would actually look for some of these, what they call pinch points. For instance, where Browns Road East meets the Cobanara, they would be at that intersection to, to let people out, so to speak. You wouldn't be blocked in because of the traffic flow. So they think of these pinch points. We have local emergency management committees comprised of uh, police, RFS, Fire and Rescue Council, and uh, the utility organisations. So they work together to find out where these pinch points are for people to easily and safely evacuate. So that's pretty important. But remember now, I do a lot of fuel load monitoring. Uh, they're near their highest potentials after all the two to three years of rain. So, you know, when they, with the switch swings, so to speak, to make potential fuel, available fuel, you know, fires can run pretty quickly. So just be very wary. Thanks. Yeah. I think the message here is it's, it's more about the weather and how uh, dry the fuels are um, over and above the amount of fuel that's on the ground. It's a combination of both, 
But without that curing effect and making that fuel flammable, then um, the amount of fuel on the ground will just keep accumulating. And there are so many areas that require hazard reduction burns, it's just not feasible um, to do them uh, for one reason or another, either because it needs to be done so often to keep the risk down, or because the particular species that live in that bushland area won't tolerate too frequent fires. Yeah, that's a really interesting, as I mentioned before, the balance between asset protection and the ecological needs, it's so fine. And uh, what uh, University of Wollongong found out is that you have to burn 10 to 15% of your landscape near the interface each year to make burning really effective. We do about two to 3%. Uh, and with the weather, it's getting harder and harder to find the windows to do those burns. So we're really up against it. Also in, within five to 10 years, the EPA in Sydney may prevent a lot of larger burns within the Sydney region due to air quality factors. So yeah, it's a really difficult process hazard mitigation. So that's why climate wise communities and being ready to leave early, it's, it's a godsend really, truly. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so we'll go back now and have a look at steps four and five, just briefly uh, of climate wise communities. As I described earlier, step four is about doing some planning with your neighborhood and getting uh, some sort of organization to help each other. Um, you know, if the neighbor's kids are home alone or uh, somebody's grandmother is staying over and everybody else is out or whatever the eventuality might be, is how can you pre-organize um, assistance for people who might be caught on their own. So there's a little exercise to go through and uh, we encourage you to uh, talk to your neighbors and uh, do the planning exercise and see if you can't come up with some sort of mutually beneficial uh, plan in case the worst comes to the worst, because you'll find this sort of plan is useful whether you have a major storm uh, or whether you have a bushfire. So um, it comes in uh, use for more than just one disaster type. So at the very end of this, we give you the links to in step five. I don't think we'll go all the way through step four. In step five, we look at the plans that are available out there, the RFSs, Bushfire Survival Plan Template, um, the SES has one. Uh, Red Cross has a multi-hazard tool, uh, a plus one for um, uh, heat waves in, in particular, because heat waves are still far and away the single biggest disaster type that causes death. So we are encouraging people to consider heat stress um, in these bushfire plans as well, because if you've got to tolerate the heat stress and you're not up to it, then you definitely don't want to be fighting a fire. And Carers Australia also have a template about how you can plan for those people who you look after. Um, just before I hand over to James about the bushfire rebates. Oh, actually, no, James, you talk about that and then just go straight onto the wheel. Okay, great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, yeah, so Kringo Council has a uh, fantastic program called uh, Bushfire Lives Rebates. It's, uh, this program offers residents in Kringo up to about $1,000, uh, a maximum that is, uh, to go towards the cost of retrofitting the house to, to all for bushfire risk. Um, we also offer up to, so that's 25% of the cost. So the, this is slightly out of date. It's actually 25% of retrofit costs up to a maximum of $1,000. We also offer 25% uh, of, of um, DA or CDC fees uh, associated with the retrofit up to a maximum of $500. Um, that's, that's to cover things like replacement windows. 
and replacement doors on pro properties that are on bushfire prone land. Because when you replace a window or a door, you have that triggers an automatic DA or CDC process. However, it's important to note that the rebate does not apply for properties that are subject to a development consent where improving the condition or the bushfire resilience of your house is a condition of consent. So for example, you're building a new house on bushfire prone land, uh, there will be a condition of consent that says that you need to do, build your house to bound 19, for example. The rebate will not subsidize that work because it's something which you would be forced to do or compelled to do by the condition of consent. It's, this rebate is only for uh, property owners who have an existing building and they just want to make it bush, more bushfire resilient. The process to get the rebate is fairly straightforward. You go to the Climate Wise Communities website, which is, uh, sorry, the Bushfire Wise a rebate page on council's web, website. Uh, here it is here. You click this first green button called uh, submit your pre-approval application. You fill the form out, click send, and it will arrive in my inbox. And then I will contact you about the additional bits of information you will need to submit. That information is going to be step three of the ready check tool, which you just seen your bushfire survival plan, which you can download from the RFS website, quotes and specifications of the work you plan on doing, along with any photographs of existing um, parts of the house that you're trying to change. For example, if you have uh, gaps in the ridge cap mortar or you're replacing uh, rotted timber framed windows and you, and you want to replace them for new bushfire uh, resistant windows, well then the photographs of those parts of the house is what I would need. Uh, once uh, we do that, I'll issue you a pre-approval. And then once you get the work done, you submit your final claim along with any photographs and, and uh, invoices that, uh, that are related to the work you've done. To see what can be claimed for a rebate, uh, you just scroll that you view the bottom of the page here and you can see what can be claimed. It's, uh, there's quite a bit there to do. It's up to you as to what fits your budget and what you uh, and what you think will provide the best uh, defense against bushfire. Now, you can do a lot of uh, retrofitting, retrofitting work to your house and that will uh, reduce your risk, but it won't necessarily, necessarily eliminate, eliminate it altogether. And uh, anyway, that's the Bushfire Wise rebate program. And it's also worth mentioning that uh, this rebate does offer a rebate toward, to go towards uh, water tanks. However, we have a separate rainwater tank rebate program, which I recommend that you use if you want to install a rainwater tank and leave this rebate program just for other things like gutter guards, new windows, etc. Okay, so that's that for the um, uh, uh, rebate. Jenny, do you want to go to the what if wheel of the Climate Wise yep. Community website? So this is the last thing we have to show you. And this is directly out of the 2009 research. They set it up as a pack of cards and we've set it up as a chocolate wheel. So basically what you do, it's a way to test your plan as to whether or not you uh, have plans in place to deal with common eventualities. So you just spin the wheel by pressing the button and it will randomly stop on something eventually. Okay, so embers and heat trap your escape. So in other words, you can't get out of your house. What would you do if embers and heat trap your escape? So your idea to leave has just suddenly evaporated. So that's when you need to be thinking about that sheltering in place and how you're going to manage that and where is the best place to be. So just by way of interest, uh, we were told once that um, <clears throat> a fellow who had embers ignite in his roof ceiling, he had put up in his roof ceiling uh, one of those water blasters and uh, that his kids had. And he went up there with the water blaster and put out the embers. So that was quite useful. So apparently some of those water blasters can uh, last a little burst of water, you know, 10, 20 metres. Um, so for putting out little spot fires in confined spaces, quite useful. 
So you can do this as many times as you like, spin the wheel. Now this is not everything that can go wrong. They're just common ones. So you need to think when you're doing your bushfire plan about what if. What if you're unsure as to whether to leave? So having a trigger that is the time to go, right? If this happens, I'm going. Now, I know, I know an awful lot of people who've reached that point and then gone, oh, I'm not so sure now. Maybe I'll just wait and see. Yeah, don't wait and see. If you've got a trigger to leave and it's safe to do so, then you need to go. So, yes, I think um, that sort of brings us down toward the end of our, our presentation. Has anybody else got anything they'd like to say? Um, yes, I do. I have one last little thing I'd like to uh, mention. Uh, we uh, To help people make uh, uh, bushfire survival plans, um, what I would like to what I like to do is offer people uh, to be part of a reminder system to make a, a bushfire survival plan. So, um, in order to do that, um, I'll launch a poll, and all you need to do is is uh, indicate whether or not uh, you would like to uh, be sent a series of reminders over the next few months uh, from me about, about making bushfire bushfire survival plans. So I launched a poll here. It's just two questions. Um, so the first one is, uh, will you plan to make a written bushfire survival plan in the next month? Um, yes, already have a plan or no? You want to take a chance? And this other question is, would you like to receive some reminder emails with tips to help you? Um, so what, these, what this will entail is about three emails over the course of two to three months. And I'll just send, simply send you just you know, some tips and hits on what, what you can do, really, nothing too onerous. And um, uh, yeah, that's basically it. You know, I, I think uh, life is busy. Things happen. I know I've got I've got a young one, and uh, I find that a uh, few well timed time reminders uh, can be very helpful when it comes to things that I'd rather not do. I mean, bushfire survival plans um, are crucial and very important, but life does tend to get in the way. And uh, a reminder here and there, I find, helps me a lot. So um, that's what I'm offering to do for you, is to send you uh, three reminders over the next three months. So I think um, uh, everyone's had a chance to indicate whether or not they'd like, they'd like to be part of that uh, reminder. So uh, I'll end the poll now. And if you change your mind later on and you do want to receive reminders, please send an email via the website. There is a, uh, a contact form you can... Uh, 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 use to contact me, or you can just contact uh, Kuringai Council directly or, or reply to some of the emails you received uh, for this workshop. At, uh, the, thing, the email is the sustainability email address from Kuringai Council. Okay, so I'll end the poll now. So thank you very much, everyone who's indicated to, that they'd like to be part of this reminder system. So that brings us to the end of the formal proceedings of the workshop. Um, I'll open it up to some questions. Uh, we have a, a question here. Uh, now, I, it's from Peter. He says that he used to be part of the local CFU unit, but after the 2019 fires, they became inactive uh, to 2019. I think the reason for this is to do with climate change. Fire danger will be catastrophic level more often than not, meaning the best plan is to leave rather than stay and defend. What are the thoughts of the CFU on the viability? What is the thoughts about the CFU viability going into the future? I think this might be going, uh, this might, might be best answered by uh, Mark. Um, by okay. Fire and Rescue. Or fire and Rescue, yes. Well, it's true, yes, the CFU is a part of Fire and Rescue. There are little community units that live in a particular locality where neighbours work together to prepare for fires. And then uh, after a fire has gone through, do some work after the fact they're not intended to fight fires and it's true that they're not supposed to activate when the conditions are catastrophic so there'll still be roles for them and uh, i mean they sort of activate and deactivate sometimes members leave people move so they they're often sort of starting up and closing down depending on the interest of the people in the locality and their capability to you know do something useful to protect their own homes 
So, you know, that, that we're still enrolling new people. We, we just had a CFU team at this conference only a few weeks ago, and there's a lot of interest, a lot of people involved. So uh, it's true that on a catastrophic day, they won't activate, but they can still do things to prepare their homes prior to a fire arriving. And I think um, some, of the, well, some of the best or the greatest value of the CFU is that community connectivity that can be generated by the members of the CFU. Um, I think uh, when one time when Jenny and I met uh, CFU over in the uh, near the Lane Cove National Park area, um, when we talked to them, uh, the, mem the members there knew everyone, they knew everyone who needed help, uh, elderly, uh, elderly people that needed help to um, get into their cars, they had mobility issues. So that just knowledge of your neighborhood and, and the people there is, often valuable and that can be a matter of life and death uh in some circumstances just simply knowing who who lives next to you and what their needs might be uh, those are the kind of things that are discussed in the step four of the ready check there how well you know your neighborhood we have a question from alexander here uh, it says that we've been through three bushfires here do not assume you will have your own town water very good point thank you alexander it's one of the first service, service, services to go out as firefighting appliances are drawing it out fast then it can come down the pipe. That is very true. Um, I believe that some people think that, why can't they just increase the pressure? Well, then that would lead to burst pipes all over the place and that just won't work. Uh, would anyone else like to comment on that? I can comment from experience in South Taramara, I think, we were one of the first trucks on site. And once we emptied our tank, we actually had to leave the South Taramara area to, to refill our tank. And that was probably within 10 minutes of the fire starting. So um, there were residents trying to put out spot fires in their front yards and literally there was a dribble of water coming out of their hoses. So I, I think it's a, a very real um, problem to, to to actually put into your fire plan and assume you will not have water. And in the same breath, you probably will not have power and you will not have um, internet either. So uh, there's a lot of things to consider and having a more robust fire plan um, and not being there in the event of a bushfire is probably your best bet. Yeah, and alongside all the things you don't have, you probably don't have much sunlight either. Uh, I believe uh, it gets dark very quickly. It could be noon and you'll th you, you could swear blind that it's middle of the night. I think uh, judging by what we saw during the Black Sun bushfires, it, it, yeah, it can be, it can get very dark very quickly, and very scary and high winds. Um, yeah, it's not, not, uh, not, not something which I'd like to experience myself. Uh, so my plan is definitely to uh, leave early. All of these things reinforce the idea that the best place to be is somewhere else because you know, there's limited water, there's a lot of the services are out, you can't see very clearly. Uh, there's, you know, if people are leaving late, there'll be panic stricken people driving down the street, there'll be smoking and dark, there'll be fire trucks, police trying to get into the area. So, you know, generally when you have catastrophic weather, it takes a few days to build up. So there's, there's usually warnings. If you, you know, use the RFS fires near me, you know, listen to the media, you see that the conditions are becoming more dangerous, the heat's building up, the temperature, uh, the humidity's decreasing and the winds are coming around to the northwest or the west. So you, you shouldn't be forced into making a last minute decision where you have to take off in a panic. If you think ahead and then, as you say, a trigger, get out, be somewhere else at that time of the day when the fire's most likely to, to arrive. Mm. Yeah, and on catastrophic bushfire danger days, as Jenny already mentioned, it's just, it's just best not to be around. Uh, it can seem a bit onerous to, to leave the area if there's no fire. However, on a catastrophic bushfire danger day, um, uh, there could be the fire, if fire does break out, as happened in Canoon Road, it can happen very quickly, impacting houses in incredibly fast. So um, one thing, for me, I live in Barara, and uh, it's a one way in, one way out. It's a high risk area. So on those catastrophic conditions, my plan is to um, go to the shopping center, go see a movie, go visit some families, uh, some members of family in some in low risk areas, go to the beach, uh, plan something fun around that area, especially if you have young children, because you can turn what could be a very scary and inconvenient thing into something that's a bit more pleasurable, a bit more fun, 
and uh, you take this, the stress out of it, and uh, and and, and uh, you enjoy you can you can, you can you can enjoy your day as, as opposed to having having it as something which is very scary and stressful, and that you don't feel as a wasted day where you have to leave. It's because uh, you're killing two birds with one stone. You're out of the area. You're safe, and you are also um, you know making something of it as well. So um, uh, Jenny, is there anything else you'd like to cover off before we uh, close the workshop? I think uh, we've, we've, covered everything. we've covered everything. I think only four questions came through. So it looks like we've done a great job on covering all the main things people are concerned about. However, uh, now, uh, if there is anything you'd like to know um, specifically about bush virus specific to your area in, uh, in that's a, uh, Browns Road or you know the, uh, the, the West Warringah area, please um, please put them in now because now's your chance. If not, and something comes to you later on, don't worry, it's not too late. You can always ask an expert via the Climate Wise Community's website. There's a function on that site where you can, on the site tab, you can put a question in and it will come to me and I will do my best to answer it for you. And I wouldn't do it because I'm an expert. I simply send these questions, your questions off to those who are, such as, members of the Fire and Rescue, RFS, CSIRO, bushfire researchers, uh, bushfire architects, and the like. So we have a lot of people we can access who have um, expertise in bushfire and in storms and other extreme weather events in general. So um, ask away any question that you like, please do, and we will get you an answer. So if there's no other questions coming through from the audience, I might call this um, workshop to an end. And I'd like to say thank you very much to um, every from the RFS members of the RFS. Uh, there's uh, Ian, I believe. Uh, uh, Sam, I know you. I know you very well. And um, and uh, uh, Craig. And again, thank you very uh, much to Mark McKay from Fire and Rescue, Mark Schuster from Council, and lastly but not least, not leastly, um, Dr. Jenny Scott from Council. Thank you very much for a wonderful workshop. And um, yeah, stay safe and. Hope you enjoy this um, this nice dry weather we have right now. All the best. <laughs>